housekeeping. As we were saying, this is recorded. Um, I'll be spotlighting our speaker, uh, Dr. Chaudhry. Um, so if you've got your lunch with you, feel free to munch away. You won't be on camera. Uh, if you have any questions uh, throughout his um, speech, um, speaking, um, please direct those questions to Mary Lou Jones in the chat. Um, it's okay if you realize after the fact that you sent it to me, I'll just forward it on to Mary Lou. But at the end of Dr. Chaudhry's talk, Mary Lou will be passing along the questions that you that you have um, regarding the subject. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mary Lou and she will introduce our speaker. All right. If for any Thanks. reason that you have any issues, if you if you lose the link, please feel free to call the office or email me and we'll get you back on. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, to keep in touch and learn about new things. And I'm especially excited uh, to have Dr. Chaudhry today introduce uh, the evolution of stroke treatment. Uh, it is a complete change in uh, maybe, and how we treat, first of all, how we treat the stroke victim, but also um, it, it, it changes a lot of things uh, that you might have been afraid of about um, stroke. Uh, Dr. Chowdhury is um, a neurosurge neurovascular surgeon with Prisma Health and the Southeastern Neurological and Spine Institute. He talked with our Physicians of Greenville class in uh, fall of 19, I believe, right, Dr. Chaudhry? Right. And we were so absolutely wowed by him that we scheduled him last spring. And then of course we didn't have classes last spring. So we um, were very fortunate to get him to come today for our lunch and learn. Um, I'm not going to spend any more time uh, on introductions, but I do want you to tell a little bit about your team, Dr. Chaudhry, and how you work together and how busy you are. Thanks so much. Yes. Welcome, Dr. Thank Chaudhry. Thank you. I appreciate the introduction and uh, the invitation to come back. Um, so our team, we were originally at uh, MUSC for about 10 years, and about two and a half years ago, we moved to Greenville. And so we've got uh, four of us uh, who are here. We have two neurosurgeons and two neuro neuroradiologists who specialize in the endovascular treatment of kind of uh, blood vessel disorders of the head and neck. So we deal primarily with strokes, aneurysms, AVMs. Um, those are kind of the main things that we deal with and we treat everything kind of minimally invasive with a through the blood vessel surgery. The great thing about our program is it's not just the four of us, but we have dedicated people within the emergency room uh, are dedicated neurologists as well as critical care and rehab. So treating stroke is not just a one-time thing, it's a whole spectrum. Um, we've got to have people who treat on the emergent side as well as well in the hospital. And then some of the stuff that we don't really talk about is really the post-hospital care as well, the rehab, which is extremely important in trying to get patients back to as much function as they can. <clears throat> So with that, I think we will start. I don't know if you guys can see my screen. Um, hold on one second. Oh, asking me for permissions here. Do you have Do you have a share screen button? Yeah, it, I'm trying. It's um. Hold on one second. It's asking me for permission to do it, and I've got a uh, one second. I may have to log out and log back in for you guys to record this. Is that okay? Or do you want to skip the recording and just let me do it? Hold well, just a moment, Dr. Chaudhry. Heidi is making you a co-host. Right now, you should be able to share your screen. I apologize. Okay.
Yay. Uh, does that work? Perfect. We can see that. Awesome. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about the evolution of acute, acute ischemic stroke treatment. Um, you guys are going to have to forgive me. I lost the talk I gave a few years ago. I kind of had to put this together last night. So if I lose my train of thought, sorry, but kind of get through this. We've got about 50 slides. We'll try to get this done in about 45, 50 minutes. Um, and hopefully you guys will have time for some questions afterwards. So a little bit of background. Um, stroke is the leading cause of adult disability. It's the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. Every year, approximately 800,000 people in the United States have a stroke. And of those, 610,000 are new strokes. So that also means there's about 200,000 people who have reoccurring strokes every year. So once you have a stroke, you're at high risk for having another one. Stroke is extremely expensive. It costs anywhere from $46 billion to $100 billion a year. That includes healthcare services, the treatment of stroke in the acute setting, um, in the hospital, <clears throat> as well as rehab, as well as medicine. And then if we include like the lost days of work and the revenue generated by patients who can't work anymore, it's extremely uh, expensive and has a huge impact on their society. So there's basically three main types of stroke. There's ischemic, which is due to a blockage in the blood vessel, hemorrhagic, which is a rupture or a brain bleed, and then TIA and mini stroke, the majority of which are ischemic, about 87 to 90% um, are, oh, I guess I have to admit people. <clears throat> um, so the majority are ischemic, a small proportion are hemorrhagic. The hemorrhagic ones are usually related to aneurysms and ABMs, and then um, intracerebral hemorrhages as well. And then the mini stroke, which is kind of similar to the ischemia, is self-limiting. It only lasts um, about 24 hours, and it kind of resolves on its own. But a mini stroke can lead to a permanent stroke as well. So a little bit more about background. So um, strokes do affect uh, a few of us in a different way. So unfortunately, here in the South, we live in what we call the stroke belt. So we're up here, you can see the, um, in this region, we have one of the highest incidences of stroke as well as the highest death rates of stroke. And unfortunately, um, you know, our, our um, African-Americans and Blacks have twice the normal risk compared to, to white people. And unfortunately, Blacks also have the highest rate of death from stroke. The group that is increasing the most is our Hispanic um, uh, patient population. Um, they're approaching the rate of um, uh, the rate of stroke and uh, as we see in the black population. So this is really important um, because we live in this area. And we have to do what we can to help prevent stroke and then also to help treat stroke as well. So there are certain risk factors that predispose us to stroke. Um, age greater than sixty-five. I think we're all kind of itching towards that age group hypertension, hyperplastinolemia, smoking, obesity, and diabetes. The scary thing is almost one in three U.S. adults have at least one of these conditions or habits, which increases the risk of stroke tremendously. So whatever we can do to help prevent stroke or help humidify or um, mitigate some of these is uh, the best way for us to help ourselves. We also need to be able to recognize that we're having a stroke or, have, or that one of our friends is having a stroke. Because once we recognize it, it's really, really important that we try to get them to the hospital as fast as possible. There's a little mnemonic called Be Fast um, to help us remember um, the symptoms of a stroke. So B, balance, loss of balance, headache or dizziness, eyes, sudden loss of vision in one or both eyes, as well as eyes deviating to one side or the other. Looking at their face, their face doesn't look even. One side will usually droop, we'll have a facial droop, the corner of the mouth will drop a little bit. The, the little fold here will become flat um, and we'll have difficulty talking as well. Um, arm or leg, you know, they'll have weakness in the arm or the leg. They may not be able to move at all or maybe just really, really clumsy. Um, speech, obviously difficulty in speaking as well as understanding. So there's two different types of speech, right? There's comprehension. So the ability, if you give them a simple command, they may not be able to understand it and they may not be able to communicate with you as well. And then there's time. So time to call 911, because it's extremely important that we recognize this and get them to the right place as soon as possible. So, and time is extremely important because time is brain. Um, approximately for every minute of a large vessel occlusion, two million neurons are lost. 
um, we only have about 65 million. So if we're losing 2 million a minute, um, you know, you can imagine what's going to happen as this goes on for a period of time. What we do know is that the only way to get better is to revascularize that brain or open that blockage and restore blood flow the best that we can. And what we found over time is that, um, you know, a good outcome increases almost four and a half to six times with, uh, with revascularization. So over the last 10 years, we've seen a significant, <coughs> excuse me, a significant evolution in our stroke, uh, our stroke therapies. So stroke treatment started in 1996 with uh, a trial called the NINES trial, which looked at using an IV medication, TPA, to break up clot. Before that, if you were having a stroke, you were basically given an aspirin, you were put into a hospital bed. If you survived the acute period, you were essentially sent to rehab and maybe you made it out of that. So in 1996, there was a medication, TPA, that was introduced that showed um, an improved benefit of um, patients who received it and that the medication would evaluate the clot, open up that blood flow, restore the blood flow, and patients did well. But the biggest limitation was that it had to be administered within about three hours because the risk of bleeding in the brain increased tremendously after about that three hour period. So for, from 1996, for the next 10 years, there was really no improvements in stroke therapy. And the hardest thing with stroke at that time period was also that people were so afraid of giving the TPA that a lot of patients that were candidates didn't receive it because of that, the fear that they could potentially bleed into the brain and kill them. In 2004, there was the introduction of a Mercy Retriever, which is kind of this fancy corkscrew retriever that we were able to take up to the brain, engage the clot, and try to remove it. Um, and we'll show you, I'll show you some slides and pictures of each of these devices um, further on. In 2008, there was another study called the ECAS-3, which looked at that IV TPA medication and really only extended the time window about four and a half hours. So after four and a half hours, there was no option for you um, uh, as far as treatment. And then also later in 2008, there was the introduction of some interesting um, catheters, so long plastic tubes that were able to navigate the tortuous anatomy of the brain up into the brain uh, vessels. And there was a little plunger, if you will, that was used to break up the clot. This is a great idea, but the only problem with it was it would break up the clot and a lot of the clot would go downstream. So downstream clot is probably better than a proximal clot, meaning a big vessel versus a small vessel. Um, but still had some, uh, had some issues. And then in 2012, we kind of came into the modern era of devices, stent retrievers, which are basically these fancy stents on a stick. And the idea was that you were able to go up into the clot, deploy it in the clot, and it would mash the clot up against the wall and restore blood flow to the brain. Um, and then you were able to remove it. A lot of times though, most of the clot would be fragmented, would go downstream. And there've been some improvements <coughs> in the stent technology as well as some of the other catheters that we use, such as balloon catheters to help arrest flow so you can actually suck the clot back in, as well as aspiration catheters, such as these fancy shop back catheters, meaning that we have this large catheter, we attach it to essentially a fancy vacuum. We help ingest or aspirate the clot out. But so there was a lot of improvement in devices, but there wasn't a really good way of picking patients. And so in about 2015, there was five or six really important studies that came out that showed in carefully selected patients, we were able to extend the time window to treatment out to about eight hours. And this is utilizing these devices with a through the blood vessel surgery to help restore blood flow and improve patient outcomes. And then only a couple of years ago, there were two more studies, a Dawn study and a diffuse study, which looked at carefully selected patients utilizing some advanced imaging techniques such as uh, the CTA, where we look at the way um, your CTA looks at the blood vessels, and then CT perfusion is which a way that we look at the way blood flows through the brain. And in carefully selected patients using certain criteria, we're able to extend that treatment window out to 24 hours. After 24 hours, we're still able to treat people on a case-by-case -case basis, but a lot of these newer studies suggest that all patients out to 24 hours could potentially benefit from treatment. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So our first device was the Mercy Retriever. This was introduced in 2004. As I said, it's a fancy corkscrew device. The idea was that you would advance this catheter <coughs> out across the clot. And here we're looking at the main vessel on the left side. This is called the internal carotid artery. You can see how it kind of cuts off here. 
we've deployed the corkscrew, but unfortunately, when you pull, you're pulling the vector forces that are such that you displace the blood vessels. Patients didn't like it because it was extremely painful. And a lot of times, the corkscrew would unravel. And unfortunately, it was only effective in about 30 to 40% of patients in retrieving the clot. So it was the first tool, so it was a good tool, but we've had improvements in the, since then. Just another example of um, why it was ineffective because of the vessel displacement, the pain and discomfort. And you can see after pulling, we still have residual clot here in the vessel. So after 2004 and 2008, there was the introduction of the number separator system. So this used that fancy plunger that we talked about to break up the clot, here's the clot. And this catheter is set to a vacuum. So we're trying to break up the clot, utilizing the plunger, and trying to aspirate or suck out the clot as we break it up. So a lot of times this would work by removing the clot, but it also had the risk of fragmenting this clot and sending it downstream, which was also something that we didn't want to do. So I'll kind of let that play for a minute. So you can see there's a little bit of work and it was a little scary trying to do this because you're in a vessel and you don't exactly know where the vessel is sometimes because you don't have any blood flow going past the clot or contrast going past the clot. And so you're pushing this little separator out blindly into the clot. And this, the, the concern, the fear was that you would push it outside the blood vessel wall causing a bleed. And so this is just a case example of that. Here we can see again, this is the internal carotid on the left side. Here's what should be the left middle cerebral artery going out to the side. You can see that there's no blood flow going to this entire side of the brain. This is the anterior cerebral artery, which comes up in the middle. It's helping to supply in a backwards fashion that, that area that's been affected. And so you can see here, we've taken that catheter out. Here's that little plunger, the separator in the catheter. You can see that we've opened up this segment, but now we have another segment that's occluded. And so you kind of have to keep chasing the clot further and further downstream. So there's a little bit of work. And you can see why that would be scary, right? You're pushing that catheter or the plunger out and the vessel is turning. Fortunately, these were relatively soft and they would follow the course of the vessel. But every once in a while, your concern was that you would potentially push it out through the vessel as well. well. And so you can see from that first picture that I showed you where it was blocked off here, we're able to restore nearly completely all the blood flow. There's a little bit of a deficit here. So it was still a pretty good result and it still helped people. And then we kind of came to the modern era of devices, which is the stent retrievers and aspiration. So stent retrievers are essentially a fancy stent on a stick. The stent is just kind of a mesh structure, kind of reminiscent of kind of chicken wire around a tomato plant that's on a stick. We're able to deliver these through catheters. So with catheters and long plastic tubes that we take up to the blockage, we have to cross that clot and then we deploy the stent retriever. The stent retriever kind of integrates with the clot, and then we're able to pull it back and remove it. The introduction of balloon guide catheters, such as this, a balloon on the catheter, we're able to inflate the balloon, prevent anagrade, or we're able to prevent blood flow from kind of continuing into the brain temporarily, just so that the clot doesn't fragment as we're trying to pull it back. And this helped improve our ability to remove, <laughs> remove these clots in its entirety. <coughs> Excuse me. So you can see that we've got the catheter and the stent retriever across the clot. Here we're pulling it back into the catheter and we're removing the entire device um, and, and construct in its entirety with the clot. While we were at MUSC, we kind of came up with a, a novel way of treating stroke utilizing these larger catheters, but without the stent retriever. And the idea was that we would take these catheters, um, long plastic tubes, all the way to the clot we would push the catheter into the clot and then set it to a vacuum. And the idea was that if the catheter was big enough, it would either cork the clot, the clot on the end of the catheter so that it was hanging out. And these clots have some fiber in them, so they're somewhat organized. And they, sometimes they stay together, sometimes they break apart. But a lot of times we're able to remove the clot in its entirety. Or with bigger catheters, because of the vacuum forces, you're actually able to eat the clot in its entirety. We like this technique because we found that it was faster than utilizing the stent retriever because we didn't have to go across the clot. We found it to be faster, um, sorry, we found it to be faster because we didn't have to go across the clot. We found it to be much, much more efficient, i.e. the time that it took us uh, to open the vessel improved tremendously. When we first started doing these cases, it wasn't common, it wasn't uncommon to work for about 90 minutes to two hours trying to open up a blood vessel. 
Now with modern day devices, a lot of times the procedure takes about 10 to 12 minutes. On an average, um, you know, for all the cases that we do, it's about a 30 minute procedure now. We also found it to be extremely cost effective. These scent retrievers, and I use the term fancy scent on a stick, and they're fancy and we pay for it. You know, these tend to cost anywhere from $4,000 to $7,000 a piece. So by not utilizing that, we save a significant amount of money in, um, in device costs as well as other ancillary costs because we're much more efficient. Um, so our procedures have become much more cost effective as well by utilizing these techniques. Sometimes we marry these techniques utilizing the stent retriever with aspiration called salumbra. So we kind of marry the two. So we utilize the stent retriever with a large catheter that's set to aspiration to help pull the clot into uh, the catheter um, and remove it in its entirety. Um, the introduction of balloon guides also help prevent the fragmentation of clot going out to the different uh, territories that were previously unaffected. So here we can see again on that left side, we've got a left middle cerebral artery occlusion. There's no blood flow here. We've got a large aspiration catheter here at the clot interface. And then we've got the stent retriever, which is trying to work and pull that clot out. And you can see, uh, sorry, this is another example, another case example. So here on the right side, we've got a right um, carotid terminus occlusion. So the internal carotid, carotid artery comes up, divides into that anterior cerebral artery, which is in the middle of the head, and the right middle cerebral artery, which should come out this way. In this picture, you can actually see the silhouette of a clock that's also in the anterior cerebral artery as well. So utilizing that stent retriever um, and aspiration, the salumbra technique, we've got our aspiration catheter here. Here you can see the silhouette or the outline of the stent retriever and the distal markers for the stent retriever. The nice thing about this, when you deploy that stent retriever, it mashes the clot up against the wall, reperfusing the brain. This is great because sometimes with the other techniques, you couldn't open up the blood vessel right away. The brain is still starved for blood and oxygen and other nutrients. With this, you instantly restore that blood flow, um, allowing the brain to reperfuse and start to heal itself. And so also with this, you can see that we've removed the stent retriever and the aspiration catheter. With one pass, we're able to restore that blood flow all the way out to that right middle cerebral artery, as well as without even going into the anterior cerebral artery, we're able to remove that clot as well. And then so with that ADAPT technique or that aspiration technique, we've also evolved within the techniques there. So originally we had smaller catheters. You know, the big thing with this was we were afraid at first of taking big catheters into the brain vessels. The brain vessels on average are about two and a half millimeters in size, so not very large and um, somewhat delicate. And so the big fear was taking large catheters into these vessels to try to remove this clot. <coughs> and so with the first generation catheters, they were relatively small, but we would take those catheters up to the clot interface, push them into the clot, turn that vacuum on. And with the earlier catheters, we would pull the clot out in its entirety. And most of the time we would see it stuck on the back of the catheter tip. And a lot of this was due, we were able to do this with innovations in catheter technology. And so this is just some example cases here. You can see again, a middle cerebral artery that's occluded. There's really faint opacification of the distal branches. You can see after pulling out the clot, here's the branches. And the interesting thing was we're able to remove the clot and you can almost see this is where the catheter kind of corked the clot. And this is actually showing us that uh, the, the clot kind of conforms to this bifurcation. This is probably the lower branch and this is probably the upper branch where the clot was sticking in. And here's also just some friends of ours that would send us pictures with the time that it took them to do this. Remember how I told you that it used to take us anywhere from 60 minutes to 90 minutes to two hours of working time. And now we're down to 10, 11 minutes, almost instantaneously with this new technique. And so again, another friend of ours is showing us the clot that he removed, the pre, the first picture showing the blockage and the post picture. I think he kind of liked it. And again, again, just showing the time that it took to do this, it was only about nine minutes. It's really interesting was sometimes we'd pull out some crazy clots. This is from a colleague of ours in uh, um, Chattanooga. So I don't know what they feed them down there, but this clot came out of this vessel that was here. And you can see this was almost about five inches of clot that we're able to remove in its entirety. But with the inner Production of newer and newer catheters and better technology, so bigger catheters, i.e. bigger diameter. Um, we had to develop new technology to allow them to navigate these twists and turns in the vessel. 
And so with these bigger catheters, what we found was that we were, instead of corking the clot on the end of the catheter, we were actually able to eat the clot or ingest it inside the catheter. This was even better because we didn't have to worry about dislodging the clot or losing the clot as we were pulling it back because you'd have blood flow kind of pushing the clot out. But now we're able to actually eat the clot in its entirety. And so here's another example or a little video of how that happens. So you've turned the vacuum on, the clot kind of comes up and engages the catheter. And then over time, and you have to give it a little bit of time, somewhere between 30 seconds to about a minute of time to let it work it'll eventually eat the clot. And the hardest for us is being patient and waiting for this to take effect. And so over the last few years, we've seen significant improvements in catheter technology, i.e. ability to navigate larger and larger catheters up to um, <coughs> those vessels in the head. So we started with catheters that were um, uh, 200, of an inch in diameter all the way up to, you know, catheters now that are seven hundredths of an inch in diameter. And now we even have catheters that are almost nine hundredths of an inch or almost a tenth of an inch in diameter. It doesn't sound like a big deal, but this is actually a significant improvement um, because the larger the catheter is, the bigger the aspiration force, the bigger the ability to remove that clot is. And so there's some now newer catheters that we can show you that actually ingest the clot even faster. So this is kind of the old technology where it comes up, you turn the pump on, the aspiration, the vacuum, and you can see how the catheter, the clot is engaged, but it doesn't really eat it all the time. With these newer catheters, they have a bevel tip, which increases the area or the surface area to contact with the vessel, or sorry, with the clot, and it's able to actually ingest and eat the clot much quicker. So I actually tried to slow this down fast enough, uh, slow enough so we can see it. You turn the pump on, you see it start to move there and then boom, gone. And a lot of times that's what we see in the cases as well. Um, you know, we pull back and all of a sudden you've got blood flow and you'll see the clot come through the, the tubing. Um, and it's really cool to see that because then you know that your, your case is likely finished. So not only do we have newer devices, but we also have better ways of selecting our patients for treatment. So <clears throat> like I said, back in about 2006, 15, I think, 2016, there were these studies that looked at carefully selected patients out to about six to eight hours that could be treated with these devices in a safe and efficacious way. About two years prior to this, there were three studies that showed that there was actually no benefit in treating patients. Those studies had lots of issues. They didn't really select patients appropriately. And these therapies almost died um, in 2015. Fortunately, people persevered. We said, hey, those studies had lots of issues. And there were seven studies that showed without, um, that showed an absolute benefit of, of mechanical thrombectomy, i.e. removing that clot uh, from the vessel with these uh, devices. And so again, you know, back then we were taking perfectly uh, um, or very carefully selected patients, meaning that they really had no significant infarct already on their CT scan. So this is a CT of the head and what we're looking for is an infarct to show that, hey, maybe their stroke has already kind of progressed and that they may not be a good candidate for treatment. But if we take people who have a large vessel occlusion, i.e. a blockage here in the main vessel, but somehow they've been able to preserve their brain because they have collaterals, i.e. side channels that are helping supply the brain, um, that these patients would probably benefit from revascularizing or opening up that blood vessel. So here's a CT scan showing that there may be very little stroke here. And usually, sorry, when we say there's a big stroke, this area like this would be all infarcted. Those patients originally we thought would not be good candidates. And so in, this tri in these trials, in these seven trials, we kind of selected patients based on their CT scan showing <coughs> a very small core infarct, um, you know, a large vessel occlusion, and then the ability to revascularize them completely. So you can see here the, uh, the blockage and then the reopening of the vessel. Um, and then fortunately in 2018, there were two other studies that kind of extended the time window. So there was the Dawn study and the Diffuse study. And again, they kind of looked at taking patients um, out to 24 hours using um, certain advanced imaging techniques. And we'll talk about those here in a second. And what they found was that originally up to eight hours in the original studies, um, there was about a 46 to 50% rate of improvement in patients who received thrombectomy. But that was within a very narrow, narrow time window. 
Now we're able to take that time window out to 24 hours and we're getting almost the same results. About 50% of the patients that we're taking out to 24 hours are still getting benefit from treatment. Um, and what we're finding is that the number needed to treat to help people is really, really low. We only need to treat about two to three people to see a significant benefit in outcomes. So these advanced techniques are something called CT perfusion, and this is looking at the way blood flows through the brain. And so we get these very pretty color maps that show us um, uh, different parameters. So we get a CT scan and a CTA, which shows us the vessels. So the CTA shows us the vessels and where the potential blockage is. Cerebral blood volume is this fancy picture here that shows us what areas are already infarcted, dead tissue, and dead tissue won't come back. But what we're really trying to determine here is what tissue is at risk. So in this patient, there's a small core infarct, but here you can see all this red is tissue that's potentially at risk. It hasn't died yet, but it's potentially salvageable. And this is all based on collaterals or side channels. And so we can kind of think of these fancy maps as a traffic jam. This is courtesy of a uh, old mentor of mine, Dr. Rowley, but he kind of came up with this analogy of kind of trying to figure out how we can go from point A to point B in the city, right? So the long tra transit times are that mean transit time, the collateral routes measure that CBV, and the variable net effect is CBF. Kind of a, a little harder to understand without really going into the details of everything, but it's really just a measure of if we can get enough blood flow to kind of go around the blockage, we're able to preserve basic housekeeping functions of the cells. And if we're able to restore blood flow, those basic housekeeping functions will maintain the cell enough that um, they can actually survive instead of dying off without um, enough blood. And so looking at those two studies, the diffuse and the dawn data, um, we looked at patient level kind of data, um, trying to see um, if we could extrapolate any other information. Um, i.e. basically selecting uh, more patients to be more inclusive. When we first started treat, when we first started treating patients, we were very, um, very, very selective about treating patients because we wanted a good outcome to prove that this was effective technology. Now what we're finding, instead of those home run cases where we're able to <coughs> remove the clot um, and then the patient gets almost back to baseline, there's something called a rank and shift. Uh, the ranking scale is a measure of functional outcome. And one is essentially normal, and, or sorry, zero is essentially normal and five is um, dead. Um, we don't want to be dead, or sorry, six is dead. And so, you know, zero, one, and two are good functional outcomes where patients are usually at home and independent. Three, patients can be at home, but they're not independent. They may need some help. Four, they're usually in some kind of care facility, five, they're usually kind of wish they were dead and six is dead. But what we found with this, these newer techniques and even extending the time period out to 24 hours, is we were still getting a lot of those home runs that patients were actually going back and being independent, but we were also saving people in the sense that, you know, those patients that may have been a four or five or a six are coming back as a three or a four. And I think in our, in our, in, um, I don't know how to say this without just saying it, but I think it allows us to enjoy some time with family um, and it still gives us a, a huge impact in the quality of life that these people have. So grandma and grandpa can still go home, enjoy grandkids, they can still be um, around the family and not to talk pure economics, but it also saves the health system millions of dollars because these patients are now going home with maybe a little bit of assisted help at home rather than being in a care facility. So the economic impact is also really huge. So we've learned over time that we can actually take people out to 24 hours. And we're also saying that we can be more inclusive in our treatment. Um, so originally I showed you that CT scan where patients had to have kind of a perfect scan. And I showed you, you know, what could be considered really bad. Um, even those bad patients that have a significant infarct do still get that benefit of that rank and shift. So, if they had um, not gotten any treatment, they would likely be dead or wish they were dead. And then with treatment, they kind of shift over to that three or four category. And so there's still a significant impact. Now, the number needed to treat in those categories higher to see the benefit, significant benefit. So we need to be a lot more inclusive in treating our patients. And that's been the big shift in our mindset in treating patients, at least at our center. I mean, there's some centers that still kind of want to cherry pick their cases because they want the best outcomes. 
we all want the best outcomes. It's great seeing those patients on the table to get back to normal on the table. And I'll tell you a story about my favorite patient was a guy who had a, a left MCA occlusion, that brand, the, the main vessel on the left side. And with that, they're usually not able to move the right side of the body. They can't talk or communicate because they're aphasic. Um, but we removed that clot and instantaneously he goes, God damn it, that hurt. I said, great, we're done. He's talking, right? So, um, you know, we want those cherry, we love to have those cases because um, they're super rewarding from, you know, our aspect, but also these cases where a lot of people wouldn't treat them, we need to start treating them because there is still a significant impact on their quality of life and their outcomes. The hardest thing is, you know, as a hospital and a physician, we're, 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 we're expected to meet certain metrics. And one of our metrics is that ranking two or better outcomes. So if I do 100 patients, I need to have a certain percentage or in that two or better outcome. Otherwise, it looks like we're just kind of frivolously doing cases. And so until everybody gets on board with expanding those metrics, it's still really hard to kind of accept all patients and treat more patients. At our institution, we kind of have um, our, our, our um, colleagues are very forward thinking and they believe in that expanded indication. So we're, we're treating many more patients, I think, than a lot of other centers would potentially uh, consider treating. And so um, just wanted to show you how we do this. Um, so this is that left middle cerebral artery occlusion. Here you can see the revascularization. I'm gonna see if I can play the video. Unfortunately, it would not, um, it wouldn't allow me to play it on um, in PowerPoint. Let me see if I can do this. Oh, there we go. And let me see. Sorry. Yeah. Can you guys see that video? Yes, no. Just give me a thumbs up. Somebody, Mary Lou, can you see it? You can't see it? No, no okay. video. Um, let me, I may have to. <clears throat> Oh, you know why? How do I go back to, oh, here we go, stop videos. Uh, nope. Let's see what like. Oh, it won't let me, hang on one second, let me try one thing here. There we go. Let me see if this will do. One second. You may lose everything and then share screen. Share. Now, can you guys see the video? Can you see this? Yes. Yes, good. Okay. So, forgive me, I'm not a videographer. But this is, and we're kind of doing this blindly because the patient was moving quite a bit, but here's a large aspiration catheter. Here's a small intermediate catheter that helps us get to where we want to go. So this is where that middle cerebral artery is. This is where the blockage is. And so now you can see the other aspiration catheter kind of navigating up around some of the turns. And unfortunately it is a little uncomfortable, but we do this awake with patients so we can see how they do after we remove that clot. And so here we've got one catheter up and we've got a bigger catheter that's coming up as well. So remember the bigger the catheter you can get there, the better your chances are at removing that clot. So it takes a little bit of work. So you're kind of telescoping these up there. And that's really about it. So this, this case took about 12 minutes to do. Most of it was getting access to the vessel over the hip, taking the catheters through the neck up to the head. And then a little bit of work <coughs> after about one pass, we're able to restore blood flow in its entirety. So that's kind of where we're at now, okay? So what about the future? So, you know, this is just one part of it that we've talked about. This is just the acute treatment. We talked a little bit about patient selection. So we have to be have better ways of detecting these patients in the field because there are mimickers to uh, an acute stroke. Patients can have a seizure, they can be hypoglycemic. There's lots of things that can mimic a stroke. 
And it's really important to determine what patients are having a stroke because not all hospitals have these capabilities. So we wanna be able to determine what patients have a stroke so we can direct them to the center. So we have different scales, scale where we have the different tests that we can do in the field that will help predict the probability of a stroke. We also have some new technology that we're working on that some colleagues are working on. Um, it's kind of a fancy visor that we place over the head and it kind of, it uses bioimpedance to measure shifts in water content to determine if you're having a stroke. And so these transmitters from the front of the head go to the back of the head. They send um, a bioimpedance wave um, across the brain and it looks for subtle shifts in fluid content because the minute you have a stroke or a vessel occlusion, the cells start to swell. And so with this technology, we're getting to a point where we can sometime, uh, we can uh, predict it, that a patient is having a stroke rather than a seizure or hypoglycemia or one of the other mimickers. So the nice thing about this is it's portable. It can be in every ambulance. You put this in the ambulance, they go to a center or a patient call. They're able to put this on the patient and then determine if that patient's actually having a stroke or a seizure and then help direct them to the more appropriate center. <clears throat> We're also working on ways to improve our efficiency of treating people and triaging people in the hospital. Currently, when you come into the hospital, what happens is if the EMS is suspecting that you're having a stroke, you come into the emergency room, you get checked in really quickly, you go straight to the CT scanner where um, you get a CT scan of the head, you get a CTA, and then you get that fancy color, color images that we, were, that we showed you. And the idea is that we're able to triage patients who are having a stroke or who may have a mimicker, such as a brain bleed or a seizure. Um, but we also want to select patients that have a vessel occlusion. We don't want to take patients to the operating room that don't have a vessel occlusion because they may benefit from other therapies. So right now that process, you know, in a very efficient system will take 10 to 15 minutes. But from there, they still have to be transferred from the CT scanner, sometimes back to the emergency room because those films have to be read or assessed and then they come back to the operating room. So there's some time wasted there. So the goal right now is to get patients from the door when they hit the emergency room door to the operating room table within 60 minutes. But what if we can do all of that imaging and triage in the operating room? So now we have newer equipment that allows us to do a CT scan, that CTA and those perfusion maps in the operating room. So now instead of stopping in the emergency room, stopping at a CT scanner, going back to the emergency room, come into the operating room, we can do it all in the operating room. So you come in, you go straight to the operating room, you get the special scans. Um, we can make that determination within about five to seven minutes, and then we're able to start our procedure. And if you remember, if time is brain, I'd rather get patient operated on within five to seven minutes or five to 10 minutes, rather than an hour and a half later. So now we're working on bringing people right into the operating room, triaging them there, especially if we have a, a pre-hospital high suspicion that they do have a stroke. We don't have to bring every patient there, but those patients that we do think are having a stroke, we can bring them straight to the operating room and select them. Um, and then we also have robotics, so a way to operate remotely. So, and, you know, the biggest limitation is, unfortunately, there aren't a lot of me, there aren't a lot of these operating rooms that have the ability to treat these patients. So what if we can operate remotely? We have a robot that can move the catheters for us. We would still have to have a person there to access the vessel and load the robot, but what if we could operate remotely? And so there could be a control center. I could hopefully someday maybe be at home operating, but we could have robots in multiple different centers. So we don't have to worry about triaging patients, flying patients. You know, you could go to the closest hospital and have the ability to be treated rather than going to a hospital, being triaged, <coughs> and then having to be transferred to another center. That could waste two to four hours. You know, we had a couple of patients over the weekend that had to be transferred from Cherokee, and that took four hours because of the weather. And if you remember that whole um, two million neurons dying every minute, he waited four hours, and he still did well, but he could have probably done better, right? Um, that's just an example of uh, one of the first cases where they were able to treat um, remotely. Um, in India, they've actually done from 200 miles away, and I think they're working on the first telecontinental or intercontinental um, robotic surgery. Um, most of this work has been done for heart stuff um, because the anatomy is much more simpler and the devices are simpler, but we're working on the ability to do this 
for the brain. And then there's also the post, post hospital part, the rehab, the part that we don't really talk about. And so after the hospital stay, let's say you do have a deficit, you have some weakness, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. These are very, very important to help get people back to as much function as possible. There's some new work being done in virtual reality and augmented reality, where we can use these headsets where, where patients can actually maybe now see their hand moving or feel their hand moving. And this helps improve um, uh, the functional recovery as well. So we have these um, virtual reality uh, headsets. Obviously you're still there with the physical therapist um, and these sensors. And the idea is you're in this space. And the idea is that if you can start to self move, you'll actually push yourself to move physically. Um, and the, uh, the rehab is getting better as well. So I think that's all I had. Of course, I didn't have a conclusion slide, but I appreciate the time and I'm happy to take any questions. I think we're just at about 45 minutes. That worked out great. It's perfect. <laughs> this is good. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, several questions were um, kind of overall things. Um, discuss, could you discuss uh, differences between many strokes uh, and a regular stroke as, as to the causes, long-term effect, and treatment? Many yeah, strokes. So many stroke, yeah, so many stroke is usually due to a, a small vessel blockage. Um, and those a lot of times are self-limiting because the body has an amazing ability to heal itself. So when a clot forms, the body doesn't like clot, it likes to try to eat it away. Also, um, those patients who do have like a little mini stroke or small vessel occlusion, that TPA works really, really well for that. Um, those patients tend to improve better. Um, and so usually the small clots are due to hypertension, diabetes, um, things that happen to affect the small vessels more. Um, versus ischemic strokes, which are due to large vessel occlusion. The large vessel occlusion, usually the clot comes from like the heart or sometimes from the neck because there's a narrowing in the neck. Sometimes we have narrowing in the blood vessels in the head, which usually due to those. Um, <coughs> I believe about 40 to 60% of uh, stroke patients, we never really find out the cause as to why or where the clot came from. So a lot of strokes are still cryptic. So, okay. Uh, how about taking cod liver oil? Does that seem to help or not as far as preventing? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Um, you know, I think anything that improves your general health, right? So anything that's going to help you with your hypertension, your hypercholesterolemia, your diabetes, smoking, weight loss, those are things that are really going to help you the most. Diet, exercise, general health. That's the stuff that's gonna have the most impact. Okay, uh, another question. How do you know where you're going when you're guiding the catheter to the clot? Uh, it's a trade secret. I have to stay at a Holiday Inn Express and that's how, no. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, we're able to see everything. Um, we have something, the, the imaging equipment that we have has the ability to take a picture and then superimpose it over what we're actually seeing. And so we're able to kind of use a roadmap, if you will. We have a map of the blood vessels and we're able to superimpose that over a live picture. And so we're able to see where we're going. Um, the wires have little different shapes on them so you can steer the wires. Some of our catheters also have special tips and shapes on the tips. So we're able to kind of guide the catheter basically where. Obviously you have to know the anatomy. You kind of have to know where you're going. Um, um, you can't just follow, um, you just can't follow the map. You have to know the anatomy as well. But the x-ray allows us to do it. Okay. Another uh, person asks, uh, because time is so critical, are you or someone in your practice on call 24-7? Mm -hmm. We have a whole team on call 24-7, 365 days a year. So there are different dedications. Um, our certifications for stroke, something called the Comprehensive Center. They have thrombectomy ready, they have TPA ready for stroke centers. And so within these different designations, like a primary stroke center has the ability to diagnose a stroke and maybe give you TPA. 
a thrombectomy capable have the ability to do the procedure, but they may not, they may not have a lot of the services that are still needed to treat a patient. So they may be able to do the procedure and have to transfer the patient or some of the other stuff. A comprehensive center um, is designated because you have a dedicated team, you have the ability to do two cases, you have dedicated neurocritical care, people who are trained in the treatment of um, you know, the critical care treatment of, of sick neuro patients. We also have rehab facilities, things like that. So there's different designations. There's two with there's, uh, Prisma Health, Greenville Memorial, and St. Francis. They're both comprehensive centers. Okay. Uh, I guess th there's a question too about anticoagulant uh, therapy. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what does that involve? Is it just a medication? It is. Um, I'm not sure, you know, anticoagulation in the, for the prevention of stroke. Um, most of the time we use antiplatelet therapy, which is a little bit different. Anticoagulation um, is usually Coumadin or Pradaxa or Effian. Um, there are other medications <coughs> such as aspirin and Plavix that help prevent, you know, platelets from adhering to each other. Most of the time we use antiplatelet therapy for uh, stroke prevention. Sometimes we use anticoagulation for stroke prevention, especially if those patients have issues with their heart. If you have like an irregular heartbeat, AFib, um, and the heart doesn't pump all of its blood out, uh, blood becomes stagnant and blood, when it's stagnant, forms clot. So to help prevent that from happening, some patients are placed on anticoagulation therapy. So it really depends on why. Um, if you have an underlying disorder, yes, it's absolutely needed. Um, taking it general to help prevent a stroke is probably not recommended because those medicines do have a risk of bleeding or causing um, uh, spontaneous bleeding. So we don't want to put people at risk for no benefit. Okay. And is this uh, your practice um, available throughout South Carolina? Any hospital, mm -hmm. I guess. And so, yeah, so the nice thing about Prisma Health, at least, is we have a whole network of hospitals. I believe there's uh, nine different hospitals that are within the Prisma network. So all those patients, obviously, you get any of those hospitals, they refer the patient directly to the main hospital where we do all these surgical treatments. We obviously work really well with our colleagues in Spartanburg, um, AnMed, <coughs> uh, Greenwood, so we cover most of the, basically from Columbia West and North, we kind of obviously cover all of that area um, because anything east of Columbia, you're probably closer to Charleston. There's also a group of uh, physicians in Columbia as well. So if you're in Columbia, I would say go to Columbia. Um, um, but if you're uh, east of Columbia, um, MUSC, um, MUSC, Roper, uh, sorry, MUSC, and try at hospital, both have people who can treat stroke as well. So if you're in Charleston, you probably, I'd love to have you fly to Greenville, but again, because time is of the essence, the right thing to do would be go to the hospital in Charleston. Okay, so uh, this universally, um, they all are doing the same thing, this 24-hour. Uh, yes. um, okay. Right. Any other? Centers now, mm -hmm. Uh, anybody has another question? If you could unmute mute yourself quickly. <laughs> what about taking baby aspirin? For yeah. prevent um, I, I don't think it hurts. Um, for the most part, uh, the recommendation is most people over 65 should be on it, unless there's a reason for you not to be on it. Any others? Okay, it looks like we got our questions answered. And this is amazing to me that you put into 45 minutes what it took an hour and a half uh, back <laughs> in, the, in fall of 2019. But um, very, very appreciative, Dr. Chandra. I'm, I'm sorry we... Uh, caused you lack of sleep or whatever last night, and I hope you I hope <laughs> you take good care of Not yourself. <laughs> okay. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right, guys. Have a good Thank day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.
Bye, everybody. Bye.